Today on Rappler, Canadian police foil an Al-Qaeda-backed attack on a passenger train in Toronto. Boston bombing suspect Zokar Zernayev says his elder brother Tamerlan masterminded the attacks. And a Pulse Asia survey shows three out of four Filipinos support gun control. Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. Canadian police arrest two men accused of planning an attack on a passenger train in the Toronto area. The attack is allegedly backed by Al-Qaeda. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police says Chaheb Esagair and Rahed Jasser were allegedly planning to derail a train traveling between Canada and the United States. Assistant Police Commissioner James Malicia says the two are charged with, quote, receiving support from Al-Qaeda elements in Iran. But Malicia adds, there's no, ad ad I'm sorry, there's no indication indication that these attacks were state-sponsored. In a statement, Iran denies allegations Al-Qaeda is operating inside its borders. Canadian police say the two, quote, had the capacity and intent to carry out these criminal attacks, but add an attack was not imminent. The arrests come as Canada's parliament debates a proposal to beef to beef up anti-terror laws. The proposed bill would reinstate provisions for preventive arrests that would stop terrorist activities before they occur and a clause on investigative hearings which would give a judge the power to require those with information on terrorism offenses to appear at a hearing. A U.S. government source says Boston bombing suspect Zokar Zernayev points to his elder brother Tamerlan as the leader behind the April 15 attack that killed three people and injured more than 170. CNN cites an unnamed government source as saying preliminary interviews with Zernayev indicate the two brothers fit the classification of self-radicalized jihadists. The report also says no international groups are involved in the bombings. According to the CNN source, Zokar Zernayev says his brother Tamerlan wanted to, to defend Islam from attack. Tamerlan was killed early Friday in a shootout with police. The 19-year-old Zokar is in the hospital for gunshot wounds following his capture after a massive manhunt in Boston Friday. He could face the death penalty after being charged Monday with using and conspiring to use a weapon of mass destruction, that's the IED, and malicious destruction of property by means of deadly explosives. A first court hearing is set for May 30th. A federal judge says Zokar was, quote, alert, mentally competent and lucid during the initial court appearance at his bedside Monday. Investigators want to get answers from Sir Naiv about the brothers' possible motive and learn whether other attacks are being planned. For our social media post of the day, it's New York State Senator Greg Ball's controversial tweet about Boston bombing suspect Zokar Sir Naiv and torture. He says, Scumbag number two in custody who wouldn't use torture on this punk to save more lives. Social news website Reddit apologizes for being a rallying point for online witch hunts for the Boston Marathon bombers. In a blog post Monday, General Manager Eric Martin says, Though started with noble intentions, some of the activity on Reddit fueled online witch hunts and dangerous speculation, which spiraled into very negative consequences for innocent parties. But Reddit maintains it served as a, quote, great clearinghouse for information in the aftermath of the April 15 twin blasts near the Boston Marathon finish line. Self-anointed cyber detectives went on social media in the days after the bombing, sharing and analyzing photos and videos of the attacks. Taking the lead from the official investigation, the online manhunt focused on people with black rucksacks. In the aftermath of the incident, Cindy Cohn of digital rights nonprofit group, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, tells AFP, quote, I don't think we know yet whether crowdsourced investigations like the Reddit one can work since this is really very new. In a resolution, the Commission on Elections orders the social weather stations, Pulse Asia, and other survey firms to divulge their, their funders. Paul Chief Sixto Brillante says the resolution covers all survey subscribers, not only politicians. He assures survey firms of confidentiality. Qualify, uh, or do not qualify. Now, what is given to us will be kept in confidence. 
The resolution comes following a complaint from United Nationalist Alliance Secretary General Toby Chanko after survey firm Social Weather Stations refused to disclose its funders. The firm said the law doesn't require them to disclose who funds their surveys. SWS says its subscribers do not necessarily commission a survey, but Brillantes explains otherwise. Kahit subscriber lang at hindi Kahit subscriber hindi lang because a subscriber is the one that pays for okay. or at least pays part of the survey. So if they don't divulge, we will apply the provisions of 9006 that's, which says my violation of election offense. The Fair Elections Act says firms that publish surveys during the election period should publish the names of those who commissioned or paid for the surveys. Brillante says those who refuse or fail to comply with the resolution will face criminal charges. National Statistical Coordination Board Secretary General Jose Ramon Albert says the country's poverty incidence in the first semester of 2012 is virtually unchanged from the same period in 2006 and 2009. The 2012 poverty incidence stands at 27.9 percent. Poverty incidence in the same period in 2009 was 28.6 percent and 28.8 percent in 2006. The government considers a family, a Filipino family, poor if monthly earnings are less than the poverty threshold. In the first semester of 2012, poverty threshold for a family of five was at 5,458 thousand pesos per month to meet basic needs. New data also show the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao remains the poorest region in the Philippines with a poverty incidence of 46.9 percent. Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Arsenio Balisacan attributes this to problems with peace and security in the region. Albert says the government's budget for conditional cash transfer anti-poverty program is only 25 percent of the required annual cost of eradicating poverty. Balisakan says, without the CCT, the poverty numbers that we are seeing here could have been higher. A former Air Force officer admits he ordered the surveillance of a labor leader murdered in 1986, but says he also ended the operation. In a hearing on his motion for bail, retired Lieutenant Colonel Eduardo Red Caponan says he had Kilusang Mayo Uno leader Rolando Olalia tailed in 1986, following reports the government of then-President Corazon Aquino had, quote, linkages with the left. Kapunan says he ordered then-Sergeant Medardo Di Barreto to conduct the surveillance but recalled it in September 1986 because he was transferred to general headquarters. Two months after the surveillance operations were ended, Olalia and his companion, Leonor Olay Ay, were found dead in Antipolo on November 13, 1986. Kapunan surrendered on October 6, 2012 and is now detained in the National Bureau of Investigation. British Bank Barclays says a surge in foreign investments in the Philippines may, quote, create additional appreciation pressure on the peso. Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Arsenio Balisacan says a strong peso is, quote, threatening to erode our competitiveness because it poses a threat to OFW remittances as well as the outsourcing and export sectors. Barclays advises the Banco Central ng Pilipinas to increase returns on foreign assets through the diversification of foreign reserves to counter the bad effects of currency appreciation. In a report titled Double-Edged Foreign Inflows, Barclays says, quote, We think the Philippines may increase exposure to higher yielding or strong growth emerging markets in order to increase their historically low returns on foreign assets. The country's foreign direct investment inflow stood at 2.033 billion pesos in 2012, up 10% from 1.852 billion pesos in 2011. A survey shows 67% of Filipinos consider guns and their proliferation to be a major cause of crime and violence in the country. In Pulse Asia's March 2013 Ulat ng Bayan survey, three out of four Filipinos support a policy of gun control in the Philippines, with people in Metro Manila more inclined to support the policy than people in Mindanao and Visayas. The report says majority of Filipinos across different geographic areas and socioeconomic classes favor a law allowing only law enforcers and licensed private security guards to carry firearms in public places. On day two of Palarong Pambansa, athletes from all over the country compete. Meet Team Caraga. What they lack in training, they make up for in spirit. Devin Wong reports. 
In a sea of brightly colored uniforms representing regions from across the Philippines, it's hard to stand out in a crowd. But one group of athletes vows to never forget where they come from. Caraga derives from its name, Sol, Kalag. Our ancient name is Kalaga, it's a soul pairing people. Known as one of the poorest regions in the Philippines, Caraga sends a modest group of athletes to this year's Palaro. But they say they'll bear and bring their all. We fight, we don't give up, we never give up. The warrior spirit of Caraga comes to life when sports level the playing field. Some are born athletes, but others are born fighters. Like many athletes here at Palaro, Jim Boy hopes his sport will earn him a scholarship so he can help support his family. He splits his time between school and helping with the family business. He only trains when he finds the time. But what they lack in facilities and preparedness, Karagan warriors make up in spirit. We are lucky enough that uh, we, have, we have everything except money. Athletes from Karaga say they're confident going into the games and particularly in combat sports. Each athlete here overcomes their own set of personal challenges. The medals are beginning to tally, but Palaro also lets athletes showcase what really counts, their passion. Devin Wong, Rappler, Dumaguete. Record after record falls on day two of the 2013 Palarong Pamadsa as action continues to heat up in Dumaguete. Brian J. Pachekov, Central Luzon, opens the day throwing 57.81 meters to break the javelin throw record in high school, boys division. NCR swimmers Catherine Bondad, Regina Castrillo and the Regents Elementary Girls Relay Team and the Regents Elementary Girls Relay Team shatter marks in 100 meter backstroke, 50 meter butterfly and 200 meter medley while Central Luzon's Rafael Barreto breaks a 200-meter freestyle record. Big city gymnasts reassert their dominance in the sport and at the end of competitions today, winning 14 of the 16 gold medals at stake. NCR continues to lead the medal tally with a total of 39 thanks to wins in swimming and gymnastics. Western Visayas is at second with 19 total medals, while Calabar Zone is at third with a total of 14 medals. Let's now look at Rappler's Wrap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number 4, San Miguel Corporation officials and the Flight Attendants and Stewards Association of the Philippines seal a collective bargaining deal that may end a 15-year legal saga. San Miguel's move addresses Philippine Airlines' labor woes under tycoon Lucio Tan following the company's move to retrench employees in 1998. The 1,600 FASAP members get a raise and more benefits for services rendered between 2010 and 2015. At number 7, nearly 216,000 people left Spain in 2012, causing the troubled country's population to shrink for the first time since the 1990s. The drop in population to 47.1 million is largely because of the departure of Ecuadorian, Colombian, Romanian, and Moroccan foreign immigrants who left the country as unemployment soared to about 25 percent. Spain's economy shrinks by 1.37 percent in 2012, the effects of the collapse of a decade-long property boom in 2008. And at number 10, Mars One, a Dutch startup, announces a call for travelers to Mars starting in 2022. Those chosen will never return back to Earth, but will live and start a colony on the Red Planet. The colony's budget is pegged at, quote, about 6 billion U.S. dollars, more than the $2.5 billion mission of NASA's rover Curiosity. That's the most advanced and biggest robot to ever go through Mars. Each flight will carry two men and two women. A new crew will join the first batch of astronauts every two years. The company says it received more than 10,000 email messages from interested would-be spacefarers.